Chapter 14 of Fifty Years in Chains, or The Life of an American Slave. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fifty Years in Chains, or The Life of an American Slave, by Charles Ball. Chapter 14, Part 2. On the morning of the execution, my master told me, and all the rest of the people, that we must go to the hanging, as it was termed by him as well as others. The place of punishment was only two miles from my master's residence, and I was there in time to get a good stand near the gallows tree by which I was enabled to see all of the proceedings connected with this solemn affair. It was estimated by my master that there were at least fifteen thousand people present at the scene more than half of whom were blacks, all the masters for a great distance round the country having permitted or compelled their people to come to this hanging. Billy was brought to the gallows with Lucy and Frank, but was permitted to walk beside the cart in which they rode. Under the gallows, after the rope was around her neck, Lucy confessed that the murder had been designed by her in the first place, and that Frank had only perpetrated it at her instance. She said she had at first intended to apply to Billy to assist her in the undertaking, but had afterwards communicated her designs to Frank, who offered to shoot her master if she would supply him with a gun and let no other person be in on the secret. A long sermon was preached by a white man under the gallows, which was only the limb of a tree, and afterwards an exhortation was delivered by a black man. The two convicts were hung together, and after they were quite dead, a consultation was held among the gentlemen as to the future disposition of Billy, who, having been in the house when his master was murdered, and not having given immediate information of the fact, was held to be guilty of concealing the death, and was accordingly sentenced to receive five hundred lashes. I was in the branches of a tree close by the place where the court was held, and distinctly heard its proceedings and judgment. Some went to the woods to cut hickories, while others stripped Billy and tied him to a tree. More than twenty long switches, some of them six or seven feet in length, had been procured, and two men applied the rods at the same time, one standing on each side of the culprit, one of them using his left hand. I had often seen black men whipped, and had always, when the lash was applied with great severity, heard the sufferer cry out and beg for mercy. But in this case the pain inflicted by the double blows of the hickory was so intense that Billy never uttered so much as a groan, and I do not believe he breathed for the space of two minutes after he received the first strokes. He shrank his body close to the trunk of the tree, around which his arms and legs were lashed, drew his shoulders up to his head like a dying man, and trembled, or rather shivered in all his members. The blood flowed from the commencement, and in a few minutes lay in small puddles at the root of the tree. I saw flakes of flesh as long as my finger fall out of the gashes in his back, and I believe he was insensible during all of the time that he was receiving the last two hundred lashes. When the whole five hundred lashes had been counted by the person appointed to perform this duty, the half-dead body was unbound and laid in the shade of the tree upon which I sat. The gentlemen who had done the whipping, eight or ten in number, being joined by their friends, then came under the tree and drank punch until their dinner was made ready under a booth of green boughs at a short distance. After dinner, Billy, who had been groaning on the ground where he was laid, was taken up, placed in the cart in which Lucy and Frank had been brought to the gallows, and conveyed to the dwelling of his late master, where he was confined to the house and his bed, more than three months and was never worth much afterwards while I remained in Georgia. Lucy and Frank, after they had been half an hour upon the gallows, were cut down, and suffered to drop into a deep hole that had been dug under them whilst they were suspended. As they fell, so the earth was thrown upon them, and the grave closed over them forever. They were hung on Thursday, and the vast assemblage of people that had convened to witness their death did not leave the place altogether until the next Monday morning. Wagons, carts, and carriages had been brought upon the grounds, booths and tents erected for the convenience and accommodation of the multitude, and the terrible spectacle that I have just described was succeeded by music, 
dancing, trading in horses, gambling, drinking, fighting, and every other species of amusement and excess to which the southern people are addicted. I had to work in the daytime, but went every night to witness this funeral carnival. The numbers that joined in which appeared to increase rather than diminish during the Friday and Saturday that followed the execution. It was not until Sunday afternoon that the crowd began sensibly to diminish, and on Monday morning, after breakfast time, the last wagons left the ground, now trampled into dust as dry and as light as ashes, and the grave of the murderers was left to the solitude of the woods. Certainly those who were hanged well deserved their punishment, but it was a very arbitrary exercise of power to whip a man until he was insensible, because he did not prevent a murder which was committed without his knowledge, and I could not understand the right of punishing him, because he was so weak or timorous as to refrain from the disclosure of the crime the moment it came to his knowledge. It is necessary for the southern people to be vigilant in guarding the moral condition of their slaves, and even to punish the intention to commit crimes when that intention can be clearly proved, for such is the natural relation of master and slave. In by far the greater number of cases that no cordiality of feeling can ever exist between them, and the sentiments that bind together the different members of society in a state of freedom and social equality being absent, the master must resort to principles of physical restraint and rules of mental coercion unknown in another and a different condition of the social compact. It is a mistake to suppose that the southern planters could ever retain their property or live amongst their slaves if those slaves were not kept in terror of the punishment that would follow acts of violence and disorder. There is no difference between the feelings of the different races of men, so far as their personal rights are concerned. The black man is as anxious to possess and to enjoy liberty as the white one would be were he deprived of this inestimable blessing. It is not for me to say that the one is as well qualified for the enjoyment of liberty as the other. Low ignorance, moral degradation of character, and mental depravity are inseparable companions, and in the breast of an ignorant man the passions of envy and revenge hold unbridled dominion. It was in the month of April that I witnessed the painful spectacle of two fellow creatures being launched into the abyss of eternity and a third being tortured beyond the sufferings of mere death, not for his crimes, but as a terror to others, and this not to deter others from the commission of crimes, but to stimulate them to a more active and devoted performance of their duties to their owners. My spirits had not recovered from the depression produced by that scene, in which my feelings had been awakened in the cause of others, when I was called to a nearer and more immediate apprehension of sufferings, which I now too clearly saw, were in preparation for myself. My master's health became worse continually, and I expected he would not survive this summer. In this, however, I was disappointed, but he was so ill that he was seldom able to come to the field, and paid but little attention to his plantation or the culture of his crops. He left the care of the cotton field to me, and after the month of June, was not out again on the plantation before the following October, when he one day came out on a little Indian pony that he had used as his hackney, before he was so far reduced as to decline the practice of riding. I suffered very much this summer for want of good and substantial provisions, my master being no longer able to supply me with his usual liberality from his own meat-house. I was obliged to lay out nearly all my other earnings in the course of the summer for bacon to enable me to bear the hardship and toil to which I was exposed. My master often sent for me to come to the house and talk to me in a very kind manner, and I believe no hired overseer could have carried on the business more industriously than I did until the crop was secured the next winter. Soon after my master was in the field in October, he sent for me to come to him one day, and gave me on parting a pretty good great coat of strong drab cloth, almost new, which he said would be of service to me in the coming winter. He also gave me, at the same time, a pair of boots, which he had half worn out, but the legs of which were quite good. This great coat and these boots were afterwards of great service to me. 
As the winter came on, my master grew worse, and though he still continued to walk about the house in good weather, it was manifest that he was approaching the close of his earthly existence. I worked very hard this winter. The crop of cotton was heavy, and we did not get it all out of the field until some time after Christmas, which compelled me to work hard myself, and caused my fellow slaves to work hard too, in clearing the land that my master was bound to clear every year on this place. He desired me to get as much of the land cleared in time for cotton as I could, and to plant the rest with corn when cleared off. As I was now entrusted with the entire superintendence of the plantation by my master, who never left his house, it became necessary for me to assume the authority of an overseer of my fellow slaves, and I not unfrequently found it proper to punish them with stripes to compel them to perform their work. At first I felt much repugnance against the use of the hickory, the only instrument with which I punished offenders. But the longer I was accustomed to this practice, the more familiar and less offensive it became to me, and I believe that a few years of perseverance and experience would have made me as inveterate a negro driver as any in Georgia, though I felt conscious that I should never have become so hardened as to strip a person for the purpose of whipping, nor should I ever have consented to compel people to work without a sufficiency of good food, if I had it in my power to supply them with enough of this first of comforts. In the month of February my master became so weak, and his cough was so distressing, that he took to his bed, from which he never again departed, save only once, before the time when he was removed to be wrapped in his winding sheet. In the month of March two of the brothers of my mistress came to see her, and remained with her until after the death of my master. When they had been with their sister about three weeks, they came to the kitchen one day when I had come in for my dinner, and told me that they were going to whip me. I asked them what they were going to whip me for, to which they replied that they thought a good whipping would be good for me, and that at any rate I must be prepared to take it. My mistress now joined us, and after swearing at me in the most furious manner for a space of several minutes, and bestowing upon me a multitude of the coarsest epithets, told me that she had long owed me a whipping, and that I should now get it. She then ordered me to take off my shirt, the only garment I had on, except for a pair of old tow linen trousers, and the two brothers backed the command of their sister, the one by presenting a pistol at my breast, and the other by drawing a large club over his head, in the attitude of striking me. Resistance was vain, and I was forced to yield. My shirt being off, I was tied by the hands with a stout bed cord, and being led to a tree, called the Pride of China, that grew in the yard, my hands were drawn by the rope, being passed over a limb, until my feet no longer touched the ground. Being thus suspended in the air by the rope, and my whole weight hanging on my wrists, I was unable to move any part of my person except my feet and legs. I had never been whipped since I was a boy and felt the injustice of the present proceedings with the utmost keenness. But neither justice nor my feelings had any influence upon the hearts of my mistress and her brothers, two men as cruel in temper and as savage in manners as herself. The first strokes of the hickory produced a sensation that I can only liken to streams of scalding water running along my back. But after a hundred or a hundred and fifty lashes had been showered upon me, the pain became less acute and piercing, but was succeeded by a dead and painful aching, which seemed to extend to my very backbone. As I hung by the rope, the moving of my legs sometimes caused me to turn round, and soon after they began to beat me, I saw the pale and death-like figure of my master standing at the door when my face was turned toward the house, and heard him, in a faint voice, scarcely louder than a strong breathing, commanding his brother-in-laws to let me go. These commands were disregarded until I had received full three hundred lashes, and doubtlessly more would have been inflicted upon me had not my master, with an effort beyond his strength, by the aid of a stick on which he supported himself, made his way to me, and placing his skeleton form beside me as I hung, told his brothers-in-law that if they struck another stroke, he would send for a lawyer and have them both prosecuted at law. This interposition stopped the progress of my punishment, 
and after cutting me down, they carried my master again into the house. I was yet able to walk, and went into the kitchen, whither my mistress followed, and compelled me to submit to be washed in brine by a black woman who acted as her cook. I was then permitted to put my shirt on, and to go on to my bed. This was Saturday, and on the next day, when I awoke late in the morning, I found myself unable to turn over or to rise. I felt too indignant at the barbarity with which I had been treated to call for help from any one, and lay in my bed made of corn husks until after twelve o'clock, when my mistress came to me and asked how I was. A slave must not manifest feelings of resentment, and I answered with humility that I was very sore and unable to get up. She then called a man and a woman who came and raised me up, but I now found that my shirt was as fast to my back as if it had grown there, the blood and bruised flesh having become incorporated with the substance of the linen. It formed only the outer coat of the great scab that covered my back. After I was downstairs, my mistress had me washed in warm water, and warm grease was rubbed over my back and sides, until the shirt was saturated with oil, and becoming soft, was at length separated from my back. My mistress then had my back washed and greased, and put upon me one of my master's old linen shirts, because she had become alarmed, and was fearful either that I should die, or would not be able to work again for a long time. As it was, she lost a month of my labor at this time, and in the end she lost myself, in consequence of this whipping. As soon as I was able to walk, my master sent for me to come to his bedside, and told me that he was very sorry for what had happened, that it was not his fault, and that if he had been well I should never have been touched. Tears came in his eyes as he talked to me, and said that as he could not live long, he hoped I would continue faithful to him whilst he did live. And this I promised to do, for I really loved my master. But I had already determined that as soon as he was in his grave, I would attempt to escape from Georgia and the cotton country, if my life should be the forfeiture of the attempt. As soon as I had recovered of my wounds, I again went to work. Not in my former situation of superintendent of my master's plantation, for this place was now occupied by one of the brothers of my mistress, but in the woods where my mistress had determined to clear a new field. After this time I did nothing but grub and clear land while I remained in Georgia, but I was always making preparations for my departure from that country. My master was an officer of militia, and had a sword which he wore on parade days, and at other times he hung it up in the room where he slept. I conceived an idea that this sword would be of service to me in the long journey that I intended to undertake. One evening, when I had gone in to see my master, and had remained standing at his bedside some time, he closed his eyes as if going to sleep, and it being twilight, I slipped the sword from the place where it hung, and dropped it out of the window. I knew my master could never need this weapon again, but yet I felt some compunction of conscience at the thought of robbing so good a man. When I left the room, I took up the sword, and afterwards secreted in a hollow tree in the woods, near the place at which I worked daily. End of chapter 14